All right, welcome back to the listener's commentary on the New Testament. In this recording, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 39. And in this section, we're still in the middle of Jesus' teaching. And as I noted in the last session, I think we should include Matthew 23 as part of the fifth and final teaching block in the Gospel of Matthew. But whether you break it down that way or not, what we clearly have here in Matthew 23 is the teaching of Jesus. And in the last section, Jesus called his followers to avoid the hypocrisy and status-seeking and self-exaltation of their leaders. His kingdom will operate differently on the basis of humility and equality. Well, coming out of that now, in this section that we'll look at in this recording, Jesus then condemns specific hypocritical actions of the leaders. The previous section ended in verse 12 by saying, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Well, flowing right out of that, Jesus turns and pronounces seven woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees. And when you say seven woes, what we're really saying is it's like the opposite of saying blessed are you, right? Blessed are you is good things for you, God's favor upon you. But when you say woe, what you're saying is cursed be you, right? And so that's the idea we have here is Jesus pronounces woes, seven of them, uh, calling out the hypocritical actions of its leaders. And then all of that in this section will culminate in a lament over Jerusalem because of her faithlessness. So Matthew 23, verse 13 says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And we've seen Jesus referred to the scribes and the Pharisees this way before in the gospel. Hypocrite refers to somebody's two-faced. They appear to be one thing, but they actually are something else. And so Jesus is calling out the scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites and says, Woe to you, because you shut the kingdom of heaven in front of people. For you do not enter it yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Now, keep in mind the setting of Jesus' ministry in Matthew's gospel. When he says you shut the kingdom of heaven, what he's getting at is you prohibit people from entering into the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is announcing. Jesus came as king, announcing the arrival of the kingdom of heaven in himself, and the Pharisees are opposing him, opposing his ministries, and they're trying to keep other people from listening to him. They've even run smear campaigns against him, and that's how they're shutting the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. And so Jesus says, woe to you for that. That's the first one. The next one, verse 15 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land and make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Think of how stinging this is. Jesus is in the temple. He has been engaging in debate with various leaders in the temple. Then he has addressed the crowd about uh, the need for rejecting the status-seeking and arrogance of the leaders, and now he's pronouncing these woes. And so some of these leaders are probably still around listening as Jesus is pronouncing this. And this is stinging. You make somebody a son of hell like yourselves. How so? Well, he says you travel around on sea and land to make a proselyte. What's a proselyte? Well, a proselyte was a Gentile convert to Judaism. That's a proselyte. And Judaism never had professional missionaries, but there is evidence from this time period, like in Josephus and places like that, where uh, there were numbers of Gentile converts to Judaism. And we see even in the book of Acts how Pharisees would travel around uh, trying to make proselytes, trying to make converts. And so Jesus says, when you do that, when you make a convert, a Gentile convert to Judaism, when the Pharisees do that, Jesus says that they're actually leading them into their own misguided approach to the Torah, their own misunderstanding of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And as a result, they're becoming twice as much a son of hell as you yourselves. And so Jesus pronounces a woe on them for that. 
Now, the next woe is longer and condemns the leaders for how they seek to find loopholes in the vows of faithfulness and oaths to faithfulness that they use. They're using their oaths, Jesus thinks, in almost like some sort of magical way. And keep in mind that Jesus has already addressed this topic of oaths in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. And he says there that oaths aren't necessary if a person has integrity. And the reason Jesus addresses the issue again here is that the Pharisees had developed whole systems of oath making. In fact, Philo, a Jew from Alexandria who lived in the first century, had a whole discussion talking about long speeches of oath making. Uh, There's whole tractates on oath making. And in their system, they talked about what kind of oaths were binding and what kind of oaths were not binding. They had levels of oaths, more binding to less binding, and all of that. So they had this whole system about oath-taking. And Jesus, in this next extended woe, points out the ridiculousness of all of that. And he does so by giving several examples of the kinds of ways they talked about oaths. And he shows how illogical it really is. So, Here's what Jesus says, verse 16. Woe to you, blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, that's nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. This is one of those little technical distinctions in their system of oath making. They would talk about, well, if you swear by the temple, that doesn't really count. But the gold in the temple, well, now you've really upped the ante and that oath is binding. And so when he says it's nothing or is obligated, what he's getting at is it's not binding versus it is binding. You swear by the temple, eh, that's not really binding. But your gold, that is binding. Jesus responds to that sort of silly little distinction in verse 17 by saying, You fools and blind men, what's more important, the gold of the temple or the temple that sanctified the gold? Which one really has more weight? Which one actually makes the gold like temple gold and special? What's more? I mean, the obvious answer is the temple is more important. He gives another example in verse 18 and says, And you say, whoever swears by the altar, that's nothing. Again, remember, that means it's not binding. Whoever swears by the altar, eh, not binding. But whoever swears by the offering that's on the altar, oh, he's obligated. That is binding. Again, you blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Like, Really, just think about it. What really has more weight? Jesus goes on to criticize this in verse 20. It says, therefore, the one who swears by the altar swears by both the altar and everything on it. The one who swears by the temple swears by both the temple and him who dwells in it. And the one who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. And so with these words, Jesus concludes that giving weight to some oaths over others based on these kinds of illogical and silly distinctions, well, that whole system is completely flawed because ultimately all of them depend on God and his authority and the temple and the worship of Yahweh. So the whole system is flawed and wrong and Jesus completely challenges all of that and pronounces this woe upon the Pharisees for this whole system of oaths. He goes on in verse 23 and says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Jesus here pronounces this woe upon them for this tithing practice, which the tithing thing isn't necessarily wrong. The law required tithing of main crops like wheat and barley or things like olive oil and wine or even tithing from herds and flocks. And some of that was shared together as like a sacred meal as a family in celebration of the Lord. Some was given to the Levites who weren't allotted any land. But the Pharisees are trying to be so conscientious about all of that tithing that they're even tithing the smallest harvest from their little herb garden. 
That's what he's getting at. Mint, dill, and cumin. These aren't even main crops. And so it wasn't even something that the law specified. Nevertheless, Jesus says, don't neglect that. He technically says, doesn't have a problem with it, right? Don't neglect that. But the bigger issue is you're paying attention to all these minutia of little religious details and you're ignoring the weightier matters of the law, things like justice, he mentions, or mercy, or faithfulness. Notice those three things almost echoes Micah's well-known words that God has shown us what's required to love mercy, to do justice, and to walk humbly with our God. Those are the things that are central. Those are the things that are more important. So Jesus says, don't neglect the tithing, but don't think tithing means you're fine if you skip out on these kind of central things. Like religious uh, minutia, religious activity is meaningless if you're avoiding or ignoring the weightier matters of the law. Jesus actually goes on in verse 24 and says, here's what it's like. Doing that sort of thing, that the little minutia of tithing, Jesus says, here's what that's like. Look at verse 24. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. And so you make sure to get all the little tiny things right, right? You get the little tiny bug out of your food or your drink, but then you ignore the really big thing, the really central things, the camel. Or in the context of what he's getting at, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Why does he pick out a gnat and a camel? Probably uh, is because in Aramaic, the language that Jesus most likely taught in originally, his native tongue, right, Aramaic, these two words, gnat and camel, sound very similar. So there's wordplay between them. The word for gnat is kalma, and the word for camel is gamla. They sound very similar, and that's probably why Jesus uh, used this little wordplay in making this point. And his point is, that's what you're like. You're straining out this little tiny gnat, uh, but you're swallowing this whole camel by ignoring the weightier matters of the law. Jesus goes on and offers another woe in verse 25. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. So picture a bowl with dried food stuck all over the inside or a glass with some dried stuff all over the inside. You don't even bother to clean all that up, but you sure make make sure the outside is all clean up. You at least wipe the food off the outside, but it's got this dried food all over the inside. Jesus, that's what you're like. You're cleaning up the outside so that you can put it in your cupboard and it looks nice. It looks clean. But inside, it's filthy. And he actually specifies a couple different things that he says, this is what you're full of. You're full of robbery and self-indulgence. Some translations say greed. The word is actually harpagmos, which has to do with grasping or seizing. That's the idea. You're full of grasping, seizing, taking. You want things for yourself. So you're full of self-indulgence and getting everything you can. And it's this filth on the inside of you that hasn't been cleaned up at all. He goes on in verse 26 and says this. Here's the solution. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside may become clean as well. And then he makes another statement, another woe that makes really a similar point. He says in verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs which appear on the outside beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. In other words, you're like tombs that are all beautified. You're painted white and you're all attractive, right? And you all look good. But inside you're full of death and disease, right? You're full of the uncleanness of death. So he says in verse 28, so you too outwardly appear righteous to people. You look righteous. You look holy and spiritual, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy, two-facedness, right? You're not what you appear and lawlessness. He's accusing them of actually being in violation of God's law, going against God's law. So he's accused them in these two woes about the cup and the dish and the whitewashed tomb of being full of self uh, 
self-serving, self-indulgence. He's accused them of being full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And both the cup metaphor and the whitewashed tomb image contrast outward appearance with inward holiness. Jesus expects people to be clean on the inside. And he says, when you're clean on the inside, the outside will take care of itself. Outward cleanness will just naturally follow. In other words, our inner dispositions, our inner motivations, our inner desires, they're actually the key to a life of genuine piety and holiness that has real integrity. And so he calls out the Pharisees and the scribes because they look good on the outside, but they're actually filthy on the inside. He offers then one final woe to the scribes and the Pharisees in verse 29 and following. And he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs for the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding of the blood of the prophets. In other words, they claim that if they had lived back then, they wouldn't have acted the way their forefathers did, who treated uh, you know, Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of the other prophets terribly. But Jesus believes that their actions... Uh, suggest otherwise, that their rejection of him suggests otherwise. And so he says this in verse 31. So you testify against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. And Jesus is actually playing off this idea. He says, if we had been living in the days of our fathers. So literally, they are descendants of the the, those who killed the prophets, right? So they're testifying literally were their descendants. But to be a son of something also commonly was used to describe to be like somebody, like father, like son, like them in character. And so Jesus is actually saying, you actually really are their son, not just in the sense that you're their literal descendant, but that you're actually of the same character as them. And so Jesus is accusing them of being faithless, uh, and having the same character flaws that their ancestors actually did. And so Jesus goes on and says in verse 32, fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You snakes, you offspring of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? And Jesus uh, bases this accusation. He doesn't specify it here, but based on his other interactions with them, and based on what he knows about them, Jesus knows they're getting ready to put him to death. He knows they're out to kill him. He's made that explicit, and that's really what he's getting at. This accusation against them is rooted in the fact that they have completely rejected Jesus, a prophet, one more than a prophet, sent to them by God himself. And they have turned against him just like their fathers did to the prophets in their day. In fact, Jesus says, it's only going to get worse. Jesus is actually going to eventually send prophets to them. He's going to send people to them. And they're going to do the exact same kinds of things to the people Jesus sends to them as their ancestors did to the prophets in days of old. Look at verse 34. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. I'm going to send people to speak the word of God to you. Some of them, Jesus says, you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will flog in your synagogues and you will persecute from city to city so that up on you will fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. And so Jesus is saying, here's what's actually going to happen. I know your character. I've seen your character and I will send people to you and you're going to do the same thing to them that your ancestors did to the prophets in their day. I can tell by your character. And Jesus actually specifies that the result of that is you're going to heap upon yourself the, the guilt of all this opposition of God's spokesman from Abel to Zechariah. Abel is the first recorded uh, person martyred, the first faithful person killed in the Bible, Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. So that's the beginning of righteous blood being spilled. The end is the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. 
Now, the question is exactly which Zechariah is this? We have the prophet Zechariah, but we have no record of him being killed except a late kind of Jewish text suggesting that he was killed. And so maybe that's the one we're talking about, or more likely, there's actually a priest named Zechariah who was killed in the temple courtyard, and that's recorded in 2 Chronicles 24, verses 20 and 21. And that's probably who we're talking about. In the Hebrew uh, configuration of their Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures ends with 2 Chronicles. It's the last book in the Hebrew Bible. So it makes sense if we're talking about from beginning to end, from Abel to Zechariah. And so that's probably who we're talking about. The only difficulty is, is that he's described as Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, and not Berechiah. Now, that, that's easily resolved in this sense, that genealogies frequently skipped generations. Just look at Jesus' genealogy in Matthew and Jesus' genealogy in Luke, and they're different. And so it's one of those two, the prophet Zechariah or this priest Zechariah, and it's probably the latter. It's probably this priest Zechariah recorded in 2 Chronicles 24, 20, and 21. And Jesus' point is that these people, the people of his day, they're of the same character as those who killed Abel or who killed Zechariah. They have the same character, and they're going to be held accountable for all of it. And Jesus says it's going to turn out bad for them. Look at verse 36. Truly I say to you, all these things will come on this generation. And it does. Read the book of Acts. And as you read Acts, you see them uh, persecuting the people that Jesus sends to them over and over again. You see them being imprisoned and being stoned to death and being flogged and being beaten. And so we see that that's what they do to Jesus' spokesman. And not only that, within 40 years of these words, Jerusalem itself will be laid waste by the Romans. And so as Jesus wraps all this up, then he turns to uh, offer a lament, expressing his sorrow for what lies ahead for Jerusalem because of their rejection of Jesus as Messiah, because of their faithlessness that's embodied in that act. And so Jesus laments, saying these words, Matthew 23, verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who have been sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. In other words, Jesus longs to have been able to care for them, to protect them, to lead them back to God and to the truth, but they would have none of it. And he knows what lies ahead for the city because of it. He knows what's coming in AD 70. And so he says in verse 38, Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. Your house most specifically refers to the temple that he's standing in. This is your house, the house in which God dwells. And really, this is a prelude to the next chapter, Matthew 24, that's going to focus on the destruction of Jerusalem. And so he says, your house is being left to you desolate. It's going to be destroyed, torn down, burned, and empty of God's presence, devoid of worship, devoid of any of the worship of Yahweh, which has been the case ever since A.D. 70. And Jesus ends by saying, For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's the culmination of all these woes pronounced upon them and this lament over their city because of their faithlessness. Now, these words are a little bit tricky. In what sense will they not see him again? Many of them will see him hanging on the cross in just a couple days. Uh, some of these leaders will be the ones that actually arrest him and accuse him before Pilate. So they will see him then. So in what sense does he mean, you will not see me until you say? And I, I think, I mean, scholars come to various conclusions and debate that. Uh, I think what we need to hear is, notice it begins with four. So he's explaining the idea of their house being left desolate. 
And so the not seeing is connected to that. And in Jesus' mind, Jesus returning to the temple is God's presence returning to his temple. But they've rejected him. And Jesus is now leaving the temple. And he's not going to re-enter it. This is the last time Jesus will enter the temple and teach in the temple uh, here before his crucifixion. It's desolate. It's empty. God is not coming back to the temple as they long for and hope because they've rejected Jesus as their Messiah. And so I think that's what he's referring to by not seeing. They're not going to see him in the temple. They're not going to see him teaching there in public again. They've made their choice. Their fate is sailed, uh, sealed and they've rejected their Messiah. And they won't see him again until this Old Testament quote, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from Psalm 118. It's the very words that were hailed to Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem. But they've rejected him as Messiah. Those words celebrate him as Messiah and King. They've rejected all of that. And so it most likely suggests that the only way these scribes and Pharisees will ever see Jesus as teacher and leader again is if they will acknowledge him as the Messiah hailed in Psalm 118. They need to repent and they need to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah as promised in Psalm 118 and so many other prophecies of the Old Testament. And so as we wrap up this section, let me just offer sort of a general overarching reflection. And that overarching reflection is this. Religious activity can actually blind us. Notice the word blind shows up three or four times in the section. Religious activity can actually blind us to what true faithfulness to God looks like. We can be so secure in our own religiosity that we miss the truth that God is trying to teach us. That was the case with the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus condemns here in Matthew 23. And it's a real risk for all of us who claim to know God and want to walk with God. So our hearts need to be soft and humble so that we listen closely to the things that God actually says with an eye towards self-examination. And we need to be pure and clean genuinely from the inside out. That's what Jesus wants for us as his people. That's what will help us continue to be open to what God needs to show us and teach us through his word. All right, thanks for tuning in to this session of the Listener's Commentary on the New Testament. The Listener's Commentary is a listener-supported, crowd-funded Bible teaching ministry that's made possible by the generosity of folks just like you. So thanks a ton for your support. You can join the team of supporters by going to listenerscommentary.com, clicking the Donate or the Give button, and it'll redirect you to a page through World Family Mission where you can set up a one-time or a recurring monthly donation right there. Also, I wanted to let you know that, uh, as I've mentioned before, we have been working on an app, and the app for iOS for Apple products is now available on the App Store. It makes it super easy to use because you can sort by book. You can actually create playlists, listen offline. You can search throughout the New Testament for keywords and then listen to recordings and teachings on passages with those words. So it's a really helpful way to dig in and study the scriptures a little bit more. So if you're an iOS user, uh, have an iPhone, then swing over to the App Store and download the app. If you're an Android user, just be patient. The Lord graciously has provided an Android developer for us, and the Android version of the app is currently in the works, and so that'll be coming soon. 